What kind of art is being created right here in Milwaukee and Wisconsin? Let's take a look at our local creativity. On this episode of the Arts Page, watch Sheboygan Falls artist Beth Lippman craft modern still life sculptures out of glass. Follow local environmental artist Roy Staub as he transforms the Renaissance Gardens at Milwaukee's Villa Terrace Decorative Arts Museum with this sculpture. And see the intersection of art and architecture as fine art painter Tim Hagland creates this mural for Dominican High School that symbolizes their history and their mission. That's all coming up now on the Arts Page. Welcome to the Arts Page. I'm your host, Sandy Max. Wisconsin is filled with talented artists whose work make you stop and appreciate the time and the craftsmanship that went into them. Glass artist Beth Lippman of Sheboygan Falls has an exhibition now at the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee called Once and Again, Still Lifes by Beth Lippman. Her handcrafted sculptures are influenced by the still life tradition of the 17th century, which focused mostly on depicting inanimate objects and paintings. In her modern day compositions, Lippmann combines a variety of glassworking techniques into thought provoking works that comment on our modern culture and life. I find glass as a material to be inspiring because of the fragility of the material, the preciousness of the material. I like the floppiness, the fluidity of the material. I like that it's a common everyday material, but it's also an aristocratic and unusual material that historically would be only owned by you know, the upper echelon of society. I'm kind of using the rich history of the decorative arts and the craft tradition to inform a larger conceptual understanding of what I'm doing. My name is Beth Lippman and I'm an artist who lives and works in Sheboygan Falls, Wisconsin. I make work that is primarily based in exploring material culture with a specific focus on still life tradition. I work in a range of materials. Most of the sculptural work that I make has been made in glass. I also do two-dimensional work such as photography, video, and lately I've been also working in metal, cast iron and brass. The still life tradition is really fascinating. It formally was titled in the early 1600s and it was a manifestation of the Dutch golden era. So it was the first time in history that people started painting inanimate objects that were front and center and a priority in the composition. It was the first time in history that food became a commodity and not just um, consumed for survival also. So it's a really fascinating history and I find that the parallels between the history of still life and the contemporary age in which we're living is really very compelling and a good place to kind of root my, my practice. So all of these objects um, are symbolic. They tell us about the culture that we're living in, the community that we're living in, and specifically about the individuals that own them as well. You'll find functional objects within my compositions, and they are technically, they would be functional. You could pick up a chalice or you could pick up a goblet and actually use it. The, the functionality is removed by the fact that it's in a conceptual work of art, referring to the function of the object as opposed to actually being functional. The sculptures themselves are three-dimensional drawings and I basically amass a large vocabulary of objects. You know, I'll just keep making components until I have a certain amount that I know will be enough to begin a composition and then I start to, you know, probably much like what you do at home, uh, move things around, see what looks good. There's a relationship between every object, not just the objects themselves, but I'm looking at line, I'm looking at form, I'm looking at mass or feeling mass, weight, texture. And then I'll just start 
kind of creating towards that particular vision. I consider myself a, a sculptor in the material, so I make a lot of different objects that are not necessarily rooted in the time frame that we're in. So you won't find an iPhone, for instance, in my compositions, but you will find rounds of cheese and plates, and you'll find forks and knives. I mean, a lot of it is tied to the idea of a banquet, but you'll also find domestic objects, generally. Also, in addition to that, I make all of the prehistoric components, the um, ancient flora, out of glass as well. So you'll find cycads, mosses, lichens. This is very recently what I've been working on. The work ranges wildly in scale. My most recent sculptures that are quite, are quite small in cast iron and brass are a shoebox size or smaller. And then they can range in size up to 26 to 30 feet long, the, the glass sculptures primarily, entire room installations, room environments. There are sculptures in the round and they include objects that are on the floor as well as on top of the table. Sometimes they include objects that are on the wall as well as the floor. I use a table a lot because it, it kind of roots me in this practice of still life and composing. So the work doesn't just reside on a tabletop. I use all different kinds of glass working techniques when I'm making the glass sculptures pretty much any technique I can get my hands on. So I, I'll take sheet glass and I'll cut it apart and put it into a kiln and fuse it together or I'll slump it over molds in a kiln. I'll gather molten glass out of a furnace and push and pat it around, blow a bubble into it. I'll cut, grind and polish with my cold working equipment that is similar to stone carving equipment actually in my cold shop. I use glue that's made for glass, so I'm a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. I'm really okay if things break. It's a part of the, the process. Sometimes I deliberately break things. Because the material inherently will at some point always break, I consider that a part of the life cycle of the work. The sculptures take anywhere from two months to the better part of a year and a half, depending upon the size. It's that capturing a moment in time. For me, it's more important that each moment that I'm creating, I'm capturing that moment in time in the practice, which is a part of still, still life tradition, as opposed to trying to represent something. We are so proud and honored to be hosting once and again Still Lifes by Beth Lippman, which was organized by the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts, went to The Hunter in Tennessee, and its final venue here is the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. So it's an exclusive opportunity to get a chance to see this unique body of work. I think when you first walk into the gallery, you can be distracted by the beauty. And then once you get a chance to come in and really look at the layers and her choice of objects and the way that she has placed the composition, and certainly when you start to read some of her artist statement and you get to know a little bit about Beth, you understand that there are many levels of meaning to her installations. While her pieces have kind of a ghostly, ephemeral, fleeting feeling to them because of the ability to look through them, you do see common objects that you might see on any table. We have goblets, we have stemware, we have food, we have platters, and oftentimes she will take one particular element and enlarge it and that becomes a proxy for the human figure, the human being. So it's almost the human being that is surrounded by these objects, creating a visual vocabulary with her objects. It is not just physically layered, literally layered, symbolically layered, but all of those things working together to communicate Beth's message and the themes that are important to her. 
What I am grateful for is that I can come into my studio every day and continue to explore in this tradition and make, make my work. You can see Beth Lipman's stunning sculptures on display now at the Jewish Museum Milwaukee until January 8th of 2017. Plan your visit to her exhibit Once and Again, Still Lifes by Beth Lipman at the Jewish Museum Milwaukee's website, jewishmuseummilwaukee.org. And enjoy more of Lipman's sculptures and photography on her website, bethlipman.com. Next, we meet environmental artist Roy Staub from West Dallas, Wisconsin, internationally known for his site-specific sculptures that he creates from materials he collects near those chosen exhibit sites. Staub's works are a reflection of the natural environment. Follow along with him at the Villa Terrace Decorative Arts Museum near Milwaukee's lakefront to see how he created his latest work, Shadow Dance. Sculpture for me is big drawings. The magic of making this work for 33 years is that that moment it comes together and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of and excited that it happens. The Villa Terrace Decorative Arts Museum will be celebrating 50 years as a public institution next year in 2017. It was the original home of Lloyd and Agnes Smith of the A.O. Smith Corporation. Agnes Smith donated the mansion to the community in 1967, and we've been enjoying it ever since. We're a community arts-based organization that features local, regional, and Wisconsin-based artists with three changing exhibitions um, every year. This is the Renaissance Garden, and it uh, came into being in 2001. And it's a, a classical garden, so that it, we're working with symmetry, and it has some classical sculptures and features to it. So we do a variety of things here. And what's great about uh, Roy Staub's exhibition is that it's the first time that we've done a site-specific sculptural installation in the garden. He is a locally based, site-specific environmental artist, and he does work all around the world, and um, he's just a, a local treasure. I call my work environmental because I use the materials from the environment, and also the site is close to the materials. The reeds are weeds, nobody cares about them, but they're growing right where I'm working. Now here I'm not using reeds, but I'm using willow. And willow grows by the lake and in an abundance, so I can pick it and it'll grow easily again. Every year I try to look for a form I could use as I progressed or changed. And then I, somebody told me about ovals. And a rounded form is better in nature than a square line when it's real long. So I'm, I'm using ovals, squares, rectangles, triangles, and it's in line. My vocabulary is line. When Roy works, he really kind of meditates on the space that the piece is going to be constructed in. And so here at the Villa Terrace, being a formal classical garden, um, he's really looking at the symmetry um, and playing off of that as well. We call it shadow dance. Why shadow dance? Because it's on this beautiful grass. It's going to be linear and there's a shadow on below it. This is a formal garden. There's a, a channel going down the middle and a crisscross, and that's the axis like most formal gardens have. My vocabulary is ovals and circles, and that's what I'm using in this piece. And they're overlapping, and it's all about space. Sculpture is space. So this piece is made specifically for this site. That's the size I can get, and I went maximum. The process of making the work is you have to collect the materials. Then you have to lay out the work. Then you have to put it together. It all takes time. I used willow, and this is a wild willow. It grows in nature in clumps by the water, and we spent five hours picking this material. So it will be willow, and the horizontal, I want it to be very clear. Grass is green, and I'm going to use reeds again. When they're bundled, they're strong. So I will use those reeds uh, as the horizontal work, a graphic work, to be seen from above and to be uh, sensed in the environment where you are down here. So we have a circle. 
We have an oval going through the circle, and as the formal garden has oval, 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 oval. And this will make the piece. You put them in, it's like a very simple thing, and then I weave the line, I'll, put the, I'll attach the line. Wove, I'll be woven and bundled, and I'll attach it to these uh, supports. It's all about balance and engineering of the work. That's what an artist has to do, design and engineering it and making it happen. We work when we have to work. Um, process, you never know how long it's gonna take, exactly. You just work until you're done. It's not a nine to five job. You work until it's dark, come back the next day, work again and again until it's completed. When the piece is done, I want it to be seen from on top. And I want, you, I want you to see a magical form of line. Uh, a line that is this formal garden in my vocabulary. Look at it from the terrace, you can kind of get the visual. It's like kind of looking at a labyrinth from above where you can see all the twists and turns. And then when you come down and get into it, you have a completely different perspective. And we're hoping that they interact with the sculpture. It's definitely something that's meant to be walked in and around and interacting with. The site-specific sculpture is only one part of the exhibition. We are also having a retrospective of photographs from Roy's work from around the world. And that's kind of the interesting thing with environmental site-specific art is that it's meant to be temporary. It's made from nature, within nature, and it's meant to decay into atrophy. And so really how that lives on is that photographs and videos are taken. And then this, the third part is a, a collection of baskets from John Shannon and Jan Sayre that Roy curated. So he went and picked a number of these baskets that are made with some of the same materials that he works with. And uh, we're gonna have these exquisite baskets on display as well. When people come to my, to my sculpture, I hope they find a kind of quietness and a peace. Peace in, in what nature is supposed to give you. So I hope they take away a peacefulness and an intellectual play of my geometry. Art has to be art. It's not about money, it's about beauty and what you can give to other people because art is sharing. We're glad Roy Staub shared his art this past summer at the Villa Terrace Decorative Arts Museum. You can see videos of his thought-provoking environmental sculptures all around the world at his website, roystaub.blogspot.com. What happens when an architectural space becomes a blank canvas? At Dominican High School in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, the staff liked their recently renovated space just outside their theater but they wanted to make sure their history and values were still a part of the school every day. This became an opportunity for an artistic parent to use his talents to achieve the environment the school was looking for. Fine art painter Tim Hagland took on the challenge and created a mural that reflects on the past, yet inspires the future. I wanted this work to be universal, as in you always find something new in it. So if you're looking for truth, justice, community, partnership, and faith, you will absolutely find it. Dominican High School is a Catholic high school located in Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin, and we are a college preparatory high school, and we are sponsored by the Cincinnati Dominicans. We are situated in our outer concourse of the school, and it is uh, adjacent to our auditorium. When this area was renovated uh, in the summer of 2015, we knew that we wanted something in the space that would really represent our mission and our five core values of truth, compassion, justice, community, and partnership. So when we created this new space that had such a, a large area for gathering, we really wanted to make sure that this wall would represent uh, the, the belief, the vision, the values of Dominican High School. The mural is the creation of one of our school parents. His name is Tim Hagland. And Tim is a well-known, beautiful, renowned artist. I'm an oil painter. I always coined a, a phrase called art and architecture. So the, the work is, is changing the environment. 
through my drawings and colors. That wall in the theater area in the concourse beckoned for something about 10 feet tall. That's 50 feet long. You know, and something that large, it can be difficult to do one painting. So this one I broke up into six individual motifs that all run together. And those motifs are going to represent the core values of Dominican High School. We wanted to make sure that it really encompassed everything from the beginning where Father Samuel Mazzucchelli came to America and he worked with Native Americans and he made sure that he not only shared education and the value of an education, but faith and, and giving us a strong foundation. The next mural is a family standing around a table with food on it in the interior of their home and that's title of family that prays together, stays together. And then the next mural is the four characters from The Wizard of Oz taking a break, resting from their journey, their travels to the Emerald City. The, the colors just strike me as being vibrant and exciting and you can walk right into that. In the fourth mural, it's a, a young man in his dorm room with a window that shows the university outside. And there'll be a chair and a table in the room and on the table will be scattered papers. And there'll be words on the papers that relate to his studies and his traveling and his dreams. His life is an open canvas and it can go anywhere. Any student can go anywhere. The fifth one is a theater scene from the Phantom of the Opera. And this one's gonna be a candid shot as if someone walked through and just took a quick photograph of the characters. And it represents movement as theater has. The last one's called Building Lasting Relationships. And the four characters are, are crammed in this boat and one has a hard hat on, representing architects, engineering, or the trades. Another one has a chef hat on, represent culinary skills. The other one has a tall stove type hat on, so that's a politician or a lawyer, and the other one has a mask on that's a huge horse head, and that represents the arts. It really shows that you can go anywhere your journey is open. The different landscapes show that we don't know where our students will go, but we hope that as this canvas really shows is that they come back here and know that this is their family forever. So that all fused together and run together, they'll be divided by trees that are painted, and on each tree will be a plaque that's cut out of a CNC machine with a scripture verse to represent truth. At the bottom of each is the Star of David representing the Old Testament, and on the top is a symbol of the New Testament. So it really brings both together. So it starts out with a little sketch, a little line sketch. From there, I'll go into a, a larger pastel drawing. And then from that process, if I like that, I'll bring my watercolors out and I will match those colors. And then from there, I'll mix those watercolors into layering of oil paint. And I'll draw it onto the canvas and then I'll start layering color through my color studies to create the image. And then once all of them are done, they'll be brought down to Dominican High School and the back of the mural gets pasted and then, they, and then they get hung. So there'll be a crew of people that hang it. This artwork represents a talent that you don't always see in the classrooms. This provides them with a view of the beauty that comes with the fine arts. It's gonna bring a lot of color and activity to the space, which is great. We're hoping that our students develop a great appreciation for the time and talent that went into this. We are hoping that it draws them in and makes them think about their own experience at Dominican. This is just a, a, an image of beauty and a future, a future that's open to them and making whatever they want to happen in their life come true.
Dominican High School students and staff get to enjoy this mural daily. You can see it too the next time you attend one of their theater or musical performances. Learn more on their website, dominicanhighschool.com. And explore more of artist Tim Hagland's decorative architectural works on his website, timothyhaglandstudio.com. Learn more about our show and catch up on episodes you may have missed when you visit the Milwaukee Public Television website at mptv.org and click on the Arts page. And please like us on Facebook at the Arts page to get updates on artists you've seen on the show and share your feedback and ideas. On the next episode of the Arts page, get ready to be surprised by art. You'll meet Shorewood painter David Lenz, whose hyper-realistic portraits look like photographs, and watch an artist transform ordinary cans into cameras. I'm Sandy Max. Thank you for watching, and please join us next time on The Arts Page. Hi, I'm Sandy Max, host of the Emmy Award-winning program, The Arts Page. Each week here on Milwaukee Public Television, we get to bring you art from around the country and Wisconsin. Thanks to the support of you and viewers like you, we can continue to tell the stories of the artists in our community. Please consider pledging your financial support for local programs like ours. Donate now online at mptv.org or call the number at the bottom of your screen. Thank you from the Arts Page team and all of us at Milwaukee Public Television.